I just found this example real quick, and this dovetails nicely into what I was planning on talking about anyhow, which is deployment. Because what we have is um, this little application that allows us to pick what image gets chosen. So we go and run this. Now notice, watch what this happens. I click that button. It is going to actually um, download and run a Java app, all right? Which is one of the ways which um, Java, lap, uh, Java apps can be deployed, all right? This is known as Java Web Start. So I go and click on it, and. downloads this file, which is a JNLP file. Now, this is all screwy, but um, as far as it does it, oh, it asks me if I want to run it. I go and run it, and there's my little app running. And I can click on the different radio buttons and change the image. All right. So let's look at the code that does that. And we even have the class here. Let me let me try downloading the class. Oh, I would need the images too. Oh well. We'll do we'll just look at the code then. <coughs> um I create radio buttons, all right, and I set a couple properties of those radio buttons, all right. One thing I set is I set a mnemonic, which is like a keyboard shortcut. So like if you notice here, if I type, what is it, control D? Alt D. It's like selecting dog. Alt P selects pig. So that's what this does. Set action command bird string. All right. This would be done if um, you wanted the action to happen immediately when you press the radio button, which in our example, you probably do not want to do. All right? So we can kind of ignore this. All right? You're going to create a listener on your button just like we've done before. All right? So, we do the same thing with the other radio buttons. Then we add those buttons to a new radio button group. That's what makes them act as a unit. All right? The idea of a radio button, just like in HTML or in your car for that matter, is that, um, that when the one button is pressed, the other buttons become automatically deselected. Now, you could have a couple of different radio buttons groups, right? Like in our example, you could have a radio button for graduate not gra or undergrad, and you could have a radio button for residency. So you don't want all five of those to act as a unit. You want to have two of them act as a unit, and then three of them act as a unit. What determines how they act as a unit is the radio button group that you add them to. All right, so adding two radio button groups. And then finally, we're adding the listener to each radio button, which we are not going to do again. We're not going to have a listener on the radio button. We're going to have a, a listener on our button, because when we're done and we press the button, that's when you want to go and do it. So this example is a little bit, little bit different um, than that. All right. So what would your listener look like? Well, 
it would be testing the radio button object that you've created. And one of the methods on that would be somewhere down here. And again, it may be in an ancestor method. abstract button so it doesn't it's not on the method itself but you would check the is selected property so you could have a series of if statements or however you want to do it to look and say radio button one is that selected radio button two is that selected and then act accordingly all right so really the radio button is no different than any of the other swing components. It's different in two senses. All right? It's different in that it must be itself part of a radio button group. Because if it's not part of a radio button group, it's not going to act like a radio button. Your radio buttons won't act like a radio button. The other thing is, is you will be testing the is selected property to see if it's checked or not. All right? So. I know this probably doesn't answer all your questions, and I heard people say that they've tried everything. So uh, if you have more specific questions, we can take a look at them in lab. But I did want to spend a minute um, giving an overview um, of that. Um, it's impossible for me to cover every single aspect of swing. That's why I think it is good practice for you to have something that you need to go in and investigate. And, and figure out how to use it. Questions? All right, beyond that, we'll take a look at um, individual questions um, in lab. Now, the question becomes is how do we get our wonderful Java programming out to the rest of the world? All right. Um, there are two sort of conceptual approaches that can be taken. And within each conceptual approach, there's um, a variety of methods that could be used as well. Keeping in mind that, um, how do I want to say this, that um, there can be some mixing and matching all right, um, for, for this. But you develop it on your machine, and it's working on your machine, and you want to get it out to the rest of the world. All right? Or maybe a better way to, to, to look at it is you are about to begin a project that you know you are going to code in Java. Let's put it that way. All right? Or that is so distracting to hear people screaming in the hall, even though the door is closed. Uh, yeah. Um, it's like this is a school, folks. I, uh, hold, hold on a second. gonna do about it you know you know break my other hip trying to <laughs> try to separate them you know that's that doesn't seem like a good idea all right at any rate now now I feel like the guy who uh, takes your baseball if it goes into his yard and and won't give it back and shakes my rake you darn kids all right uh, deployment 
Probably the better question is, is you are starting to develop an application. You're starting, you at, you're, in, you're with an organization and you want to give some sort of functionality to someone. All right? If that isn't a vague description of the problem. All right? But all these things come into play, right? Because the question of what kind of functionality are you talking about and who is that someone becomes very, very important. All right? So if we speak in the broadest terms, that's our goal, is we want to give some kind of functionality to someone. All right? Finding out what that functionality is and finding out who the people are uh, are going to be key in us deciding what approach we're going to take. All right? Simply put, there's, there, again, there's some crossover here and there's some mix and match, but simply put, you can deploy the app on the client or you can deploy it on the server. All right. Before we go into any details here, let's consider the who and the what of the situation and try to think of the advantages and disadvantages and maybe consider the sort of functionality that might work better in one mode, the sort of functionality that might work better in another mode, and then a kind of audience that might work better in one mode, a kind of audience that might work better in another mode. What are the advantages of deploying the solution on a client? Speed. Okay, speed in what sense? Okay. And Okay. So no network traffic getting to the server. Right. And it can run untethered which means that if you are not connected to the internet, you can still run. All right? What other advantages and or disadvantages? And it's interesting because we could either take like the optimistic or the pessimistic uh, uh, viewpoint, right? We can speak of the advantages of one or we can speak of the disadvantages because it's like they're two sides of the same coin. The advantages of one are the downsides of the other. So, for example, the disadvantage of having it to the server is that you do need to be connected to the network and that there is going to be network traffic and that can have an impact on the speed of the functionality. So, we can, again, we can phrase these things either as advantages of one or disadvantages of the other. O other advantages or disadvantages. Exactly. With the server, you only need to update. Up, I'll just put it this way. Updates are easy. So, if we were to develop, and we'll talk about some of these specifics in detail, if we were to develop a website using Java, all right, versus we created an application in Java, and the application is downloaded and installed on different machines. If you compare that, if we fix a bug, we have to then make sure every single person downloads and updates their installation or people will be living with that bug until they do. All right? And that may or may not be a, a problem. Whereas if you talk about running code on a web server, there's only one copy of the code that matters, all right? You update the web server with the application. Everyone, the next time they visit the page, gets a new functionality. And therefore, if there is a bug, um, then, um, then uh, it would immediately be fixed. Other advantages, disadvantages. Okay. Going to have... Sometimes this is called thin clients, all right? Um, 
In other words, if we were to run an application that was deployed on a web server, what are your software requirements on the client? Pardon me? Well, well what, what, what software would you need to, to have to run a web application on a client? A web browser, right, that's it. Anything that has a web browser could theoretically run it, all right? Now again, there could be browser compatibility issues. Maybe if you have a browser on a flip phone, it wouldn't work too well. But theoretically, it could. Because if it, pardon me? Yeah, right, right. That's more of an HTML-ish issue. As far as a server co side code, it could work, all right? Because all the, to all, the, all the heavy lifting is being done on the server. The client is just communicating via HTML forms, which have been around for ages, all right? Yes. Yes. Uh, this would be the, the, the one that I did, the, the Java web start, would require the JRE. It would not require the JDK. And most people, or many people, would have the JRE installed. So yes, and again, this is one of those, that's sort of one of those hybrid solutions, all right, where most of the work is done on the server, but the client has a little bit of a role. Uh, I guess sort of the extreme situation would be, I give you a disk, all right, that has my application that you install on your machine. That's the, that's the far end of the client situation. The far end of the server is you only need a web browser. And again, then there's some that kind of fit conveniently in the middle there. But you're absolutely right. That would be one small requirement to, to run um, in some modes it is that you would need the JRE install if you're going to run the Java actually on your client as opposed to viewing a website that is, um, is running Java. Yes? Server would be easier to troubleshoot? Probably, yeah. Because, um, you know, again, you have one version of the code. You have access to the server resources. Um, so you're not relying on someone telling you what happened and maybe missing an error message or giving you a misleading error message or something along those lines. So yeah, it would probably be easier to troubleshoot. Anything else? The client would be more secure, probably a, a, a safe bet, because if it's running on all the client, you don't have, you run into the risk of transferring data and, and all that. So it's probably, yeah, probably a security issue um, as far as that. So I'll buy that. Certainly keep track. All right. What if data need to be sh needed to be shared? Where what would that mean? Pardon me. Well, I mean, I mean, for example, you know, let's let's think of let's think of a popular application. You know, Facebook. Would it do any good if your Facebook status updated only on your mobile device? No, right? All right. So again, you may have a native app on your phone, but it still talks to something on the network side. All right. So if there's sharing of data, sharing of data would be something that would typically be done in a network environment, right? Simply because, you know, that's the idea of networks, is pulling stuff together um, and, and uh, um, you know, having, having multiple people be able to access the same thing. I'm trying to think if there's other considerations. Yes? 
client can run more powerful software, what do you mean? I'm not following what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Let me think of a way to put that because I, I see what you're getting at now. Uh, this is this this is this is getting into the advantages of distributed computing, and that is that you're sharing the load better. You're sharing the load in a more efficient way by having the client do more stuff that takes the load off of the server. Okay, so yes, in, in that sense. And it's funny, it's like that's almost kind of contradictory because it's like we could have a more powerful client, but we could also, if we do things on the server, we could have like a nothing client, you know, a very thin client. No, I guess that's not co uh, contradictory, that'd be complementary because the one side favors the client, the other favors the server. But yes, in this case, that is, uh, that's the whole notion of distributed processing is that you, you, um, you know, uh, you know, if if you want to if you want to haul a bigger cart, you either get bigger get a bigger horse or get more horses, right? So, uh, if if you want greater processing power, either you make sure your one server is really 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 powerful, or you spread the load and let the client do more of the work. All right. Other thoughts on this, and again, keep in mind that. We're thinking in extremes. We're thinking of a completely untethered application and we're thinking of a, a network application that runs through a browser. There's a whole range of stuff in between. And those kind of things like have some of the advantages of one and some of the disadvantages of You know, they, 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 they get some of the advantages of each in those cases, but also they get some of the disadvantages. Server can be cross-platform. Yeah, um, the server can support cross-platform clients more easily. So, for example, if I was uh, developing a web application, um, it could be accessed via phone, via Mac, via PC, and so on. Now, Java itself is cross-platform, all right? So, um, but still, um, you know, um, it would be even more cross-platform because it wouldn't even require Java. So uh, it would remove that one limitation. Now let's think of the who and the what of stuff and sort of come to the conclusion of like the kind of stuff that would lend itself to one approach versus the other. So what about in-house versus the general public? In other words, I could be developing, you know, that, that's the who. I'm giving this functionality to, right? If the who I'm giving it the functionality to are employees of the same organization I work for, what's the implication of that? Okay. Right. In a in a in a relatively closed environment or a smaller environment, if it's your organization you tend to have more control over that than you would over the general public. So, for example, I may know the power of the machines my users typically have if I'm doing an in-house application. You know, I can talk to the IT people and find out. I can maybe impose some restrictions and say you have to download the JRE to run this. With the general public, you have less control and you exert less of an influence. 
So therefore, general public stuff, well, that kind of slips into the network uh, advantages just from the perspective of the, the deployment. Now, when you get in really large organizations, you sort of almost get close to the general public sort of uh, um, situation. Um, I worked um, on an application for uh, Rockwell uh, automation a bunch of years ago. And um, it was a, uh, a client-based application. So you had to download the application and install it. All right. Even that case, even though we were in a organization where we would have more control, there were simply so many engineers that used our application that we still had the deployment nightmares. So you, you preface your comments with a smaller organization. You'd be able to, you know, say, hey, download this update. You know, go to the 10 people that are running this application and say, you better install this update because it's critical. Whereas if thousands of people are using it, it's a lot harder to force them. Especially in our case, um, our application was written for field engineers. And field engineers went out to factories and, and worked on the equipment, the, the heavy machinery in the factories and so on. And at least at that time, which is like the early 2000s, um, your network connectivity could really be a potential issue. In other words, they may not have had a good way to, to connect to, a, to an app. And uh, the downside, again, is they might not be installing and updating um, that just because their network connection was bad if they were at some out-of-the-way place. All right. So if we're doing an application for a group of in-house people, we can sort of take some more control of the situation, as opposed to if we're dealing with the general public, we're not really in a position to dictate to as great a degree. So that would lend itself to possibly looking at um, stuff network-based. Definitely if you're talking about sharing stuff, network-based becomes really appealing. Uh, in the particular application I'm talking about, we had to have uh, code that synced up each person's local application with the network application. And that would be a pain to, you know, so if um, a field engineer made an update that said, okay, this, this factory in Singapore had this work done, that had to go up to the server. So even though it was a client, solution, it had to go up to the server so the next field service engineer that was going to repair that machine could see the history and say, okay, on November 23rd, 2015, this engineer did this thing. All right. So again, even though it was largely run on the client's notebooks, all right, there still was a network component for it because of the need to share data. All right. So whether you need to share data, that is... Um, um, uh, would lend itself in one way or another. Hey, if we're talking about an address book, all right, an address book, there may be occasion for me to share it, but it's pretty much just my information as, comp as compared to, for example, me entering grades where you need to see the grades and, and, and so on. Every student needs to see the, their own grades for their class. So something like that, some network connectivity would come in. Now again, the thing to keep in mind is in all these solutions, there's sort of the middle ground. So like with my application that was on uh, at Rockwell that was installed on the client machine, there was still some networking because we had to share data. All right. And in the case of that Java launch, which was a server-based thing, I still had to have the JRE installed on my machine for it to work. So there can be sort of middle ground between um, these things. All right, let's run down um, some, some solutions for deploying an application, deploying a Java application. And again, typically these are the kinds of decisions that would be made up front. In other words, you wouldn't write a whole bunch of stuff and say, well, I want to make that an Android app. No, you know from the start that you're making an Android app. All right, so if we're running down the options, one is that we can install 
from a jar. Jar meaning Java archive. So it's kind of like a zip file for Java classes, if you will. If you think about it, even some of our applications, which are pretty small, when you get into the student um, example with graduate students and courses and half dozen different exceptions that you could, you could call, you could give someone all of those class files and they could run your application just by delivering the class files. The problem with that is what if they missed one of the class files or whatever. With the Java Archive, you sort of bundle everything together into one thing that could be installed and then you can run it. All right? So you can execute, you can run from a Java Archive file. All right? Second thing you could do is you could run from, you could in, uh, make an install for an Android app. Android apps have something like a jar, but they're called .apk files. I think that would stand for an Android package. Now the nice thing about Android deployment, deployment versus regular client, like if I was going to give you an app for your PC, is that Android already, already has a common sort of install scheme. And if you deliver an APK file, then Android's installer knows what to do with it. And you don't have to write any specific install code to do that. Uh, with a jar, and it's been ages since I've done this, uh, and in fact, I didn't even do it when I was part of that team, but um, we would take our compiled code and someone would run it through a little install preparation package just so that they could create a little executable that would install our, our object code on a client's machine. So in this case, we can create the jar easily within Java, but to write a nice little install program that would go in and allow you to in, uninstall it and maybe create some registry entries and that sort of thing, that would require some work beyond just creating the jar. Whereas in Android, you create an APK, that's ready to install. All right. Um, when you install, uh, install an Android application, for example, it warns the person installing it about any special permissions it, it needs. All right. So, for example, if your application accesses the camera or uh, uh, uses storage to store data or requires the network or, or uses the network or whatever, all those things are put in a manifest that when you compile it, you don't have to do anything and when they install it, it warns you of the permissions. So you, like, you can't go back and say, gee, I didn't know this would pop my camera on. You know, It warns you about that in advance and you can, you can choose to do it or, or not do it. All right? But at least you know the capabilities of the, of the app. All right? Both of these, again, are about installing it on a client. So the application gets installed to a client. Now to be sure, either from a conventional Java application or an Android application, there still could be network connectivity. But the application itself would live on the client side. So, for example, if I download and install the Android app for Amazon, that app lives on my phone. Now, if I go and do a search for a particular kind of item, that runs out to the network, grabs the data, and returns it back to my phone's app. So, yes, there is still some network connectivity, but the application itself lives on my device. All right. Other ways that are more server oriented and again this could require some things being um, required or sent to the client. One is what are called applets. Uh, 
I'm putting this on the server side of the equation, even though there's a heavy client component, simply because, as from a deployment perspective, the application lives on the server and gets delivered to the client as needed. All right. In the old days, you might have a Java chat client, for example, that was an applet. And what is an applet? An applet is a Java application that runs inside of a browser window. All right. So let's see if we can find an example here. This will be, even though this did not work, this will be useful for demonstration purposes. Apps have sort of gone out of favor, and therefore a lot of, or I'm sorry, applets have sort of gone out of favor. So a lot of browsers do not support them anymore. So I'll mention them, just in case you see them, and there's a bit of a history lesson, but... I was concerned about this. This is not even going to let me run on, on either of these browsers without me going in and playing with the configuration of these. So I could probably get it to run if I played with the configuration, but um, applets have sort of gone out of favor and browser makers have sort of uh, made it difficult to run applets within them. But these were popular sort of in the golden age of the internet and um, there'd be Java applets for all sorts of, of things. Yes? Um, I do believe there were some security concerns um, in doing that. Even though applets supposedly can't Obsolete, right. Because applets themselves are supposed to be secure, but again, they sort of have fallen out of favor. Oh, far fall with some topics. Java Web Start has advantages over applets, compatibility problems, different JVM, are independent applications that run in a separate frame. They can run Java Web Starts, which don't allow them to. Okay, there's security issues with the Java Web Start, which I'll talk about in a minute. But apparently you can get through those simply by signing your application.
Right. There are a lot of compatibility and, and other sorts of things. I think it just got to be a headache for browsers to implement that, so they decided like not to. I just wrote my first applet because neither IE or Netscape. Wow. The Java plugin was too heavy. All right. Flash is what applet should have been. You know if the solution is Flash that this must be old, but we can um, we can um, sort of extrapolate some of these things. Java plugin was too heavy. That makes sense. Again, it was it was a bigger pain for um, uh, browser developers to do that. Uh, and again, the support on different platforms um, was different. Um, oh, that's the same one. Okay. Uh, not to mention that, um, yeah, right, right. Uh, also, um, a lot of the functionality of an applet could be accomplished with, with Ajax, all right? So that would be another thing, a, a more contemporary killer of Java applets, all right? So I'll mention that, but... Um, I remember when our former accounting software did a switch from HTML to Java applet, suddenly a very e fast and easy UI was changed to a slow and unusable semi-desktop-ish application. All right. Java applets may have had advantages in the 90s, but in the age of Ajax, they are mostly obsolete. All right. Anyhow, so mentioned for historical reasons, uh, but by definition, they are um, Java applications that run within a browser. All right, so they run as part of a web page. So just like you would embed a video or embed an image or an audio file, uh, you could embed a Java applet. Um, next thing is the thing that we saw before, which is Java Web Start. And I'm going to open this up in another browser, so I hope I get asked the same questions I did before when I ran this uh, before class. All right, I click that. And notice it immediately fires up browse, uh, the Java um, runtime environment. And it asks me if I want to run it or not, and I can disable this question and all that. This would be um, a way of getting around security uh, issues because you're warned of the fact that you're running it. And if it's not something that you thought you wanted to run, then you could back out of it. Whereas in this case, I know this is coming from Oracle. It's okay. I can run it. I can now click on Run. And I get this, and this is a Java code, which is lived on the server, got delivered to me, in a jar, all right, and uh, got delivered to, to, to me via a web page and Java Web Start, sent me a file, the file opened up, and now I'm running a standalone Java application, which is built in to be secure so it can access resources and so on, but you can sign your application and allow people for trusted sources to say, yes, allow this to write a file or whatever. I don't think you could even do that with applets at all. Applets were, uh, simply ran within uh, the browser window. So the key to this is this works like a link, but this doesn't run in a browser window. It's initiated from a browser, but it opens up in a Java window. Yes? 
Yes. Well, no, th this would give us the compiled files. Okay, so we're not seeing the, the source code. In other words, we're not seeing the .java files. We're getting a jar. And what is a jar? It's a Java archive. It's a collection of class files that are smushed together into a jar. All right, a Java archive. No, no, just the compiled stuff goes in it. Yes, yes, because we're just, exactly, exactly, we're sending a jar. So um, the lesson of this is even if you're going to use this approach, which is a server-based approach, you need to know how to make a jar, all right, which is one of the things that you'll do on your um, next, I think, the, the final assignment. So Java Web Start um, is this technique. Um, I'll say a web app, and that would be like an ASP.NET app application, web application, all right? Many of you have probably done uh, ASP.NET web applications. That's where you have code that runs on a server and communicates to the browser by sending HTML. So all the browser needs to know is HTML. The browser doesn't need to know C Sharp or Java or anything like that. All the hard, heavy work is done on the server. And the server simply uses HTML to communicate and to provide the user interface to the clients. All right. So this would be like ASP.NET except using Java instead of C Sharp. Now there's two flavors of these. And we'll probably talk about these um, in more detail and look at an example. We won't write any of these, but we'll probably look at examples. Both of these, from a technical viewpoint, compile the same way. All right, so the end result is like the same. So one doesn't have a technical advantage, really. Uh, over the other. JSP files are like HTML documents that contain Java code. Java servlets are Java classes that create HTML code. So both of these are a merger of HTML and Java. It's kind of like JSPs, the Java lives inside of HTML. Servlets, the HTML lives inside of Java. All right. And in both cases, you get to the same goal, that it runs on the server, it produces HTML, that HTML is sent to the client, and then further requests get processed by the same thing. So that's really the difference for for, between these two. So both of these flavors are web apps that use Java. It's just a matter of like which direction they go. What we are going to do in this class, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to learn how to compile and make a jar, all right. We are not going to do this because you need to have some fun in the Android class. So you need to take the Android development class. This is like all great movies, right? Great movies always set up for the sequel. Well, I try to have my classes the same way so that this class, hey, you want to find out how to do this? See the sequel, all right? Applets, we might look at an example, but we're not going to spend much time on it. JWS, we will also look at an example, 
but not spend a lot of time with it, knowing that the first step in JWS is to create a jar. And in fact, if you create a jar, it's trivial to use JWS to invoke that jar from a browser. So we'll look at JWS. And likewise, web applications, JSP and Java servlets, we'll look at examples. So for the most part, do, ignore, look a little bit, look, look, look. So that's what we'll be doing over the next few days. Um, the most essential of these is to figure out how to make a jar. All right? Because you'll do that sort of regardless of any of the other approaches that you take. Even these would involve, near as I remember, creating jars. It's been a while since I worked on a project like this. But near as I remember, um, you would create jars in that case. All right, next time we'll actually go and see how we can compile and make a jar, and then we will cover as much of the rest of the stuff as we can. Um, once I cover this, I'm done. I'm going home. It'd be like, have a good vacation? What? No, 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 I'm, I'm just kidding. Once I cover this, which could be on Wednesday, or it could be next Monday, the rest of the time we have in class will simply be work time. All right, so I will not cover any additional topics after this. Any remaining time you have will be simply for you to catch up and finish all your assignments uh, and so on. Yes? Final will be online, yes. And I'll have more information for that probably next week. Other questions? All right, see you up in lab.